today as through long ages past, tremendous forces are at work tending to reduce all land to sea level. In arid regions, wind-driven sand sculptures grotesque forms out of solid rock. The ceaseless action of waves upon the shore carves rocky cliffs. Glaciers gouge out deep valleys on the flanks of massive mountains. But of all the gradational agents, running water is by far the most powerful and effective. From the land, and more especially from the expansive seas, water is continually being evaporated. This moisture accumulates to form clouds, which under certain conditions discharge their burden. Wherever rain falls, some of it soaks into the earth and some evaporates, but a large part flows over the surface in brooks and streams. Constantly, it seeks a lower level. The small brooks flow into large streams, and they in turn unite with still larger ones. Finally, they become broad, sweeping rivers that flow eventually back into the ocean. Thus, they complete a cycle in the never-ending movement of the waters on the earth. Following a heavy rain, surface water flowing down slope may quickly erode a gully. Gullies form rapidly in overgrazed pastures or on unwisely cultivated hillsides. They are enlarged and deepened with each succeeding rain. The gully grows by rapid erosion at its head where the slope is greatest. As the gully lengthens, it drains a larger area. Thus it obtains more water and is able to cut down its bed more rapidly. The cutting tools of running water are sand and rock fragments. In dry weather, these tools lie inactive along the bed of the gully. Eventually, the gully is eroded deeply enough to tap springs and seepages. In this way, the stream develops a permanent flow. Even after it has carved a great canyon, the stream is still young. The steep banks and narrow bed show that most of its force is still expended in eroding its channel. This deepening of the main river channel increases the gradient along its tributaries so that they too are excavated rapidly. Meanwhile, as the stream becomes older and the cutting of the bed gradually lessens, the chief erosional action is directed at the banks. Thus, the valley widens out and a floodplain begins to form. The river has been slowly changing from youth to maturity. As the river widened its valley and increased the number of tributaries, its drainage area came to look like this. Now, as a still older river, the main stream, sluggish and aimless, wanders through a broad, fertile floodplain. Meanwhile, the tributaries are developing floodplains, and their divides also are being eroded to more gentle slopes. Finally, the entire river system becomes a broad, flat region called a peneplain, thus completing a cycle of erosion. During most erosional cycles, there are many temporary geological features of great importance. For instance, the St. Lawrence River system, with its great lakes, majestic waterfalls, and swift rapids, is still young. Even before the St. Lawrence becomes old, all of these transitory features will have been eliminated. In the history of this river, Niagara has existed but for a moment. Its huge volume of water plunges over a stratum of hard limestone 
beneath which lies weaker shale. The shale is easily eroded. After years of continual undermining, blocks of limestone break off and fall. Since 1764, records have been kept which show that Niagara's rocky rim has been receding at the rapid rate of about five feet every year. In less than 200 years, the falls have retreated from the position indicated by the dotted line to the rim in 1934. An old river meanders back and forth across its floodplain. During high water, it may change its course and eliminate large bends by cutting across them. After this occurs, the old loops of the river's former course remain as crescent-shaped lakes called oxbows. This is an airplane view of a large oxbow. And this, a map showing other lakes of this type in the Mississippi Valley. An old river may be rejuvenated by a general elevation of the Earth's crust. Then, as its gradient increases, the river has to commence its erosional work anew. If it is able to cut its bed rapidly, it may maintain its old serpentine course. Here are meanders that became deeply entrenched as the region was gradually upraised. Some rivers even maintain their channels, although mountain ranges are slowly elevated across their courses. By such a process has come into being many water gaps like the Delaware. Man has long made use of these natural avenues of easy travel, eroded through mountain barriers by running water. Wherever streams erode the Earth's surface, they also transport and deposit the displaced material. Where the gradient of a stream is abruptly decreased, its sediment may be deposited as an alluvial fan. A sandbar is another type of stream deposit. Sandbars commonly form in the river itself where the current is retarded as on the inside of the channel at a bend. These bars are transitory and are shifted when the current increases in velocity. A fan-shaped deposit forms where a river flows into a body of quiet water. Here, its velocity is decreased abruptly. Its sediment is deposited in the form of a delta. Above the deltas, the low banks of some rivers are reinforced by levees which hold seasonal floodwaters in check. But occasionally, even this protection is insufficient. The raging floodwaters overwhelm the levees and surge out over the low-lying countryside. Thus, the sluggish old stream regains some of the strength of the vigorous young river. Enriching man's land even while it is destroying his home, it is yet beyond his complete control. Thus we have seen that running water through geological ages has been wearing down the higher lands of the earth and transporting their materials oceanward. Were it not for great opposing forces, rivers would long since have brought all land to the level of the sea.